<laughs> okay, great. So let's get started. Um, before um, it gets too late here. So, um, well, thank you everybody for coming tonight to this. Um, this is our final Zoom talk um, of our 2023 winter lecture series. So I'm glad you could all make it, especially those of you in the Berkshires, since we a lot of us did have power, uh, lost our power at some point in the last couple of days. <laughs> Um, so I'm Heather Kowalski, the executive director of the museum. For those of you who don't know me, and before we begin, um, I always just want to note a couple of housekeeping things. So um, if you could please keep yourself muted, just so we don't get any background noise, but you are welcome to leave your camera on throughout the presentation. Um, for the um, uh, controls for both of those at the, are at the lower left of your screen. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box, and then we'll take some time at the end to ask as many as we can. Uh, this is our last Zoom le lecture of the winter, but we're also planning an in-person maple sugaring demonstration on March 25th, and you can register for that on the website. And then we're also planning a, uh, we're following up this talk with a foraging walk on the Bidwell property in June, led by Russ Cohen, and we'll have more information about that on our website in the early spring. And so now I'm going to go on to our speaker tonight. So before retiring in 2015, Russ was the Rivers Advocate for the Massachusetts Department of Fish and Games Division of Ecological Restoration, where one of his areas of expertise was in riparian vegetation. Russ's, drop, Russ's job brought him out to the Berkshires on a regular basis as he covered the Hoosick and Housatonic Rivers and watersedge as part of his job responsibilities. Now Russ has more time to pursue his passionate avocation, which is connecting to nature via his taste buds and assisting others in doing the same. In addition to leading over three dozen foraging walks and talks each year at a wide variety of venues throughout the Northeast, he has also set up a small nursery in Western Massachusetts where he grows plants that he propagates from seed. He then partners with land trusts, cities and towns, schools and colleges, state and federal agencies, tribal groups, organic farms and others to plant plants from his nursery in appropriate places on their properties. And now I'll pass it along to Russ. Thank you, Heather, and hi, everybody. And it feels, uh kind of a um, little surreal to be talking about green and growing things with over a foot of snow on the ground. Uh, here in Eastern Mass, where I'm talking to you from, we had just four inches from that storm. It was enough to ski on this morning, though, which is great since uh, cross-country skiing is my favorite form of exercise during the winter time. So anytime there's any snow to ski on, I am out there. So, But here we are at night uh, in our cozy setups. Uh, I'm talking to you from uh, our guest room here, where we're going to talk about um, wild edibles. Now, um, <clears throat> now there are a few wild edibles to gather in the winter time, even with a foot of snow in the ground. But we're going to focus on stuff that is more available after the snow melts. So that's what the focus is on tonight. Uh, before we get into that, I like to. Uh, acknowledge that um, wherever we are, I'm in Eastern Mass, so I'm in Massachusetts uh, Tribal Homeland Territory, uh, out where the Bidwell House is, that's uh, the Stockbridge Munsee Band of the Mohican Tribe Territory, and uh, it's important to recognize that, but I like to go into some additional land acknowledgements in the talks that I give due to the actual content of the talks I'm giving. So for example, for all the native species I talk about, uh, I happily acknowledge and am extremely grateful for uh, figuring out what's edible because it's the indigenous people that inhabited um, this area that we now call New England and, the, and Massachusetts and the Berkshires that figured this all out. Uh, over millennia of interacting with these plants and and deep observation. And so, boy, am I grateful for that. And also, uh, there's a lot of other important indigenous teachings that uh, have a lot of applicability to uh, foraging. So uh, if I were to point you toward one source of that, it's this book, Braiding Sweetgrass, one of my all-time favorite books. And in here, the uh, author, indigenous botanist Robin Wall Kimmer, um, she has a chapter devoted more or less to foraging. It's called The Honorable Harvest. And here are the principles that she's come up with. 
And I, I liken these principles to the Ten Commandments of Foraging. And she suggests in her book that we might even want to make a laminated card and bring it with us out to the woods when we're thinking about gathering anything to go through this uh, process first, which I think would be a great idea to follow. This is particularly important for native species because native plants often have important roles in the ecosystem. Animals rely upon them for food or some other portion of the life cycle. So it's really important to use forbearance and restraint when you're gathering native plants to make sure you don't upset the ecological balance in any way. And um, so, uh, so the forbearance and restraint, that is a really fundamental uh, uh, teaching that's part of uh, indigenous um, uh, teaching and interaction in the environment. So it's really important for us to, to heed that important message. So, uh, but there are plants at the other end of the spectrum uh, that are in our midst as well. And some of those are invasive species. And um, so here you'll see an image of a book that came out about a uh, dozen, 15 years ago, uh, where it chronicles what are considered to be 66 of the most uh, ecologically deleterious non-native plants that occur in Massachusetts. And um, and these plants are very ecologically disruptive. And the main bad thing that invasive plants do is they usurp the habitat of the native species. They take it away from them. So ecologically, they're very disruptive. But if there is a silver lining to this invasive cloud, it might be the fact that some of these plants are edible. In fact, out of the 66 species covered in this book, at least 20 of them are edible. And as far as most ecologists are concerned, they'd be thrilled if we picked and ate as many of these as we possibly could. So it's a total guilt-free foraging opportunity. You can't pick too many invasive species. Uh, now you do not want to spread them around by gathering them, but that is easily avoidable. So um, here's a, a list of a half a dozen or so plants that I find especially yummy, and we definitely be covering several of these in the talk. So as I said, with native plants, it's important to deploy the forbearance and restraint to make sure that you don't pick too much. Uh, but with the invasive species and the weeds that I'll be getting into later in the talk, uh, it's a much more relaxed form of foraging. All right, so let's start with one of the iconic edible species of New England, and this are fiddleheads. And were this to be a live group, I'd ask for a show of hands to say, how many of you know what exact species this is? Because that turns out to be kind of important. And maybe out in Berkshires, you folks are, are much more educated about this. But my experience in Eastern Massachusetts is that foraging for fiddleheads is one of the biggest mistakes that novice foragers make. Because they'll be walking in the woods in the spring and they'll see a bunch of ferns curled up at this stage called the fiddlehead stage. And they'll say, oh, fiddleheads, boy, that looks an awful lot like what I've seen for sale in the stores. It must be the same thing. And so they pick it and they bring it home and they cook it up and it tastes horrible. And they say, oh, where do we go wrong? Where they went wrong is they harvest to the wrong species of fern. I only know of two species of fern that taste good and only one that's safe to eat in quantity and that is this one. And this is indeed the fiddlehead fern, what we call the fiddlehead fern. This is the ostrich fern. I'm gonna teach you the five ways to distinguish the ostrich fern from any other species of fern. So the first thing you wanna look for is you'll see that the fiddleheads, they're in a vase shaped clump. Can you see that? And it will be even more obvious once they grow out a little bit more. And then uh, if you look carefully, you'll see this little uh, groove on the inside of each stem. And uh, if you cut that in cross section, you would see it forms a U shape. So look for that. And then on the outside of the curled up parts are these papery scales that flake off really easily with your fingers. Uh, so it's not like the wool on a cinnamon fern. Now, where are you gonna find ostrich ferns? Um, oh, before I get into that, I want to uh, give another uh, nod of thanks to Indigenous people to talk about uh, that sometimes in Indigenous language, there's important uh, what's called TEK or traditional ecological knowledge uh, embedded in the language. And I learned this in this particular case from a uh, ethnobotanist, Nancy Turner, who's actually from the Pacific Northwest, but she uh, tells us, uh, 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 informed me that the Maliseet tribe, which is the tribe that in, uh, whose traditional homeland straddles the main New Brunswick border, that their uh, word for the ostrich fern fiddlehead, masos, is the exact same word they use to describe the circling motion a dog makes before it lies down. And when I heard that, that just blew me away you know, it's it's the resemblance is is obvious once you hear it, but um, I just would not have put the two together until uh, it was brought 
to me as this, uh, you know, so this is what I'm talking about, these really valuable observations by indigenous people over thousands of years about uh, the plants and animals that they uh, coexisted with all that time. All right, so here's the kind of habitat you're going to look for ostrich ferns. They will grow other places, but this is where I typically see them in alluvial floodplain, very silty soil. So this photo was taken along the Connecticut River, but I could have easily taken this photo along the Housatonic or Hoosick Rivers, very similar. So you look for that. And then the uh, fifth and last thing you want to check for are these things right here. These are called the fertile fronds or the spore bearing fronds. And um, and that's how the plants reproduce. And they'll be out at the fiddlehead time too. They won't be in every clump of the fiddlehead ferns, but they'll be uh, in that patch where you're seeing them. And if you cut the stems in those little fertile fronds too, you'll also see that they form that U shape too. So the combination of all five of those things, that's the ostrich fern. There's no other fern where all five of those uh, properties I just taught you apply. All right, so let's get back to the um, conservation issue because this is a native species and this is the fern that you see for sale on the restaurant menus and the produce stores and stuff like that. And as far as I know, nobody, at least not yet, is farming fiddleheads. And so when you see fiddleheads on a restaurant menu or in a store, they were harvested from the wild. And that's not inherently bad. I mean, that's the whole theme of this talk is to gather things in the wild. The problem is that when wild plants become articles of commerce and there's a, um, <clears throat> there's a monetary value assigned to them, unfortunately that triggers some unscrupulous irresponsible behavior on the part of some people. So the, uh, the kind of foraging that I encourage on the ostrich fern fiddleheads is to take just one or maybe two of the cold up parts per clump let the rest alone, let them grow out. And that's a totally sustainable level of harvest. The fern can absolutely handle that amount of picking. But unfortunately, what some of the greedy people do is to go into the woods and they'll pick every single fiddlehead they see. And that puts a lot of strength on the plants. You can actually kill the plants by harvesting them that hard. So that's my advice, just one or two per clump. All right, now, if you've ever bought fiddleheads at the store and brought them home and cooked them up and weren't very impressed with them, you might want to try this cooking method, which was amply demonstrated by this uh, woman here, Beth Basler, who's a, a, a naturalist for the Northfield Mountain Environmental Education Center along the Connecticut River. And she took us to a fiddlehead patch along the Connecticut, and she brought her camp stove with her to that fiddlehead patch. And we were eating those fiddleheads 10 minutes after we picked them, and they were truly exquisite that way. So that's what I'd recommend. All right, so here's another springtime edible plant. So this is marsh marigold. Now this is a very valuable springtime wildflower. And so we wouldn't wanna harm this plant in any way either, just like the ostrich fern. Um, and you want to harvest the leaves before the flowers come out and you wanna pick just one or two leaves per plant. That's all you want to gather. But I've seen places in the Berkshires where there are thousands of the plant, these plants like growing under alder uh, thickets. And if you're encountering so many in a place like that, even at just one or two leaves per plant, you can gather all you need. And you absolutely have to cook this one. And I should have said that too with the ostrich fern fiddleheads. You absolutely have to cook it to make it safe to eat. And on this one, I might even encourage uh, changing the water once or twice just to make sure you're going to dispel all the toxins out of it. And then it will taste a lot like spinach. And you might say, you know, I'm going to go to the store and buy spinach. And that is totally fine. I just like to teach the marsh marigold because this was at one time a really important plant for, um, you know, Going back, I mean, not that far long ago, like before the Second World War, before, uh, you know, a lot of people didn't have refrigerators and, you know, they were living off things they had put up in the root cellar. And um, and so in the spring, they were really eager to start eating green and growing things again. And so marsh marigolds leaves and the ostrich ferns were, uh, you know, leafy green vegetables that are available before anything was happening in their gardens. So uh, that was great for them. So that I'm mentioning more of historical interest than any, you know, that, that we all would need to go out and, you know, pick a mass of marsh marigolds, but they're out there and you could gather them if you wanted to. Uh, just pick the leaves before the flowers come out, one or two leaves per plant and boil them at least once before you eat them. Oh, and you can propagate marsh marigolds from seed. And Heather mentioned I've got this nursery. So that's one of the plants I'm growing in my nursery, seed grown marsh marigold plants. 
Okay, so this species is native to the Berkshires, and it's a species that's been in, you know, the northern part of the um, United States, uh, you know, way before it was the United States for thousands of years. So these plant that that uh, indigenous people knew well. In fact, there's two place names, Chicago and Winooski, were both uh, place names named after the species. And so when the settlers arrived, they got to know the plant too. And they'd gather modest amounts of it, like when they'd be out in the spring, trout fishing, turkey hunting, uh, that'd be fine. They'd gather some of these plants and that was all fine too. And then about 15 years ago, this species began to achieve a meteoric rise in popularity because all the chefs and foodies started hyperventilating about it. Now, the name before that time, the, the New England name for this plant was called the wild leek, and it is related to leeks. But that's when it started to be called ramps because that's the southern Appalachian name. And so that that name moved north as the... Um, you know, the, the chefs and foodies discovered, oh, this plant grows in the Berkshires. And unfortunately, what that has engendered up here is a bit of a gold rush mentality in the part of some people where they go into the woods, not to gather some plants for themselves, but to convert the plants to cash. And they'll see a patch like this, a patch of wild leeks, they'll dig up every single plant. Now, that's obviously not a sustainable way of harvesting this plant. So here's another look at what the wild looks, leeks look like in the wild. And they uh, are almost always found in what's called the rich woods habitat, where you have a uh, higher pH soil. We have some of the wonderful spring ephemeral species like the Dutchman's breeches and wild ginger and beta hair fern and um, uh, uh, plants like that that like to grow the, the, the uh, uh, blue cohosh. And so that's where the wild leeks like to grow. So um, so here's a close-up of the plants. You'll see that each plant has two or sometimes three leaves and they go down to a little bulb, which is kind of like a scallion bulb. And um, now here's the nice part about harvesting this plant from the wild. You don't have to dig up these plants to eat them. The leaves are delicious. So you can leave the bulb in the ground. In fact, that's the kind of harvesting that I'm trying to persuade people to shift to. Please consider harvesting just one leaf per plant, leave the remaining leaf, attach the bulb, and leave the bulb in the ground. That's a totally sustainable way of harvesting this plant. Because the problem is that when somebody digs up a whole patch like that and they're leaving any bare ground behind, they're creating an ideal growing medium for an invasive species to sneak in that I'm just about to teach you. All right, so anyway, so here is on the left, you'll see the, the pickled uh, wild leek bulbs. And this is from a very famous restaurant called Blue Hill at Stone Barns down in Westchester, Dan Barber's restaurant. And he wasn't even using these wild leeks in his fancy menu dishes. He was just pickling them and selling them at his store. In my opinion, <clears throat> this these plants were dug up unnecessarily. And here is a photo I took a long time ago. I don't know if this is still happening uh at the uh food co-op in great barrington and you'll see the stamp there locally sustainable Chevrolet bitch well these were wild leeks with the roots attached and in my opinion that's just not sustainable uh now i do know of very large patches of ramps in the berkshires and would you like to have all the market foragers from new york city come up and dig up thousands of pounds of those plants no i think you want to encourage them to to interact with these plants in a more sustainable way so that's what i'm trying to do and let me do, give you just one data point where this has happened so when I was working with the Fish and Game Department back in 2015, I get an email at my office and the email had wild ramps in the subject line. And I thought, oh, great. Some foodie has tracked me down in my office and they want me to divulge the location of a wild leek patch. So they can go plunder it. And it turned out that that email was from the produce manager of the Hunger Mountain Food Co-op in Montpelier, Vermont. And he was writing to tell me that based on what they had learned from me, they had decided to sell small bags of only one leaf per plant wild leek leaves and they wanted permission for me to put a little statement from me inside each bag to explain why that was a good idea so i was really grateful for that so and there's some more good news i have to share with you about this plant you can propagate this plant which is what the uh New England Wildflower Society, now called the Native Plant Trust, is doing at their Garden Woods facility in Framingham, is they have these stock beds that they're able to cram full of wild leek plants. And every so often, every like, uh, I'm going to guess, four or five years, they can extract a few plants from the um, 
the stock bed and they leave enough in there to replenish it. And then they let it lie fallow for four or five years and then they go back and dig some more. Now, this is the site that I don't like to see usually when I see the plants dug up with the roots attached. But in this case, it's okay because they pot these plants up and then sell them with all the other plants they're growing at their plant sale facility at Garden of the Woods. And so you can go there and buy plants and then get your own wild leek patch established in your own yard, which would be great. But if you do that, I bet you're not digging those plants up because that would be like killing the goose that laid the golden egg. No, you're going to leave the bulbs in the ground, just harvest the leaves and enjoy the wonderful flavor. And then you'll have a sustainable patch in your yard. Okay, so let's go to the other end of the spectrum. We're talking about a plant that's, um, it's um, there is a native version of this and a non-native version of this, but uh, the the way you harvest this plant doesn't harm the plant at all, and it's very abundant, so you can relax about it. This is a plant called stinging metal, and it really does sting. So it's kind it's not like poison ivy at all. Poison ivy, you find out a day or two later you got into it, you get stung by stinging nettle, you know right away. But the good news about the sting and stinging nettle is it rarely lasts more than an hour. And there's an antidote, at least one antidote I'm going to teach you. So what I do with these plants is I will just, now I can do this with bare fingers, but if you're a novice, you might want to wear gloves when you do this. You just take the top cluster of leaves from each plant, uh, snip that off, and then put it in your plastic bag and then bring it home. So when I get home, I'm using tongs to fling the uh, nettle tops into the cooking pot and I'm more or less steaming them with the water still clinging to them from the washing process. So you steam them for about five minutes and they'll shrink down quite a bit. And after you steam them, you can eat them just plain. The flavor is kind of like a uh, similar to uh, split peas or you could use them instead of cooked spinach in all kinds of recipes. So for example, Here's a recipe from my book. This is cream of stinging nettle soup. This sounds like something they might have made in the old Adams Family TV show. And it's just a pureed soup with a pure sauteed potatoes and onions and uh, thrown in with a uh, steamed nettle greens and the chicken stock and the half and half. And it's really good. And then here's stinging nettle ball. So this is the retro recipe from the 1950s, the spinach ball recipe, where you're basically using Pepperidge Farm stuffing mix to hold it all together. And you just substitute the steamed nettle greens for the spinach in that recipe. And that works great. Okay, so this plant I've seen growing wild in the Berkshires, and it looks a lot like the nettles, which is why I dropped it in in this spot. Uh, but if you look carefully here, you'll see it's got a square stem on it. It's got opposite leaves to it. And that's the characteristic morphology of plants in the mint family. And this is a mint. And if this were a live group, I'd be saying, what mint is it? And occasionally people know, but often people don't know. It's a plant you all know. It's catnip. So I've seen catnip growing wild in the Berkshires. Now it isn't, it is a cultivated plant. So it's a, it's a garden escapee when you see it in the wild. It's not a native species, but it's a non-invasive species. It's actually, I don't run into it that frequently, but I put it in the show because it is wild. And uh, catnip is the opposite effect on people that it has on cats. It's a sedative, it's a tranquilizer. So people will drink catnip tea to relax after a stressful day and you can use the leaves fresh or dried either way. Okay, now here is nettle and catnip growing next to each other. So here is the catnip in the foreground and the nettles in the back. So you can see how similar they look. Now you're not gonna get stung by the catnip and the catnip has got once again, that square stem to it. So those are two obvious differences when you get right close to the plants. Okay, here is one of the antidotes to the stinging nettle. It's an edible plant too. This is called curled or curly dock because it has these undulating leaf margins to it. So here's a photo from the spring and you go into the center of the plant and gather the tender leaves just unrolling and then I'll bring those home and get a pot of water boiling on the stove and drop the tender leaves in and I'll blanch them I'll cook them for 20 seconds and that's it and that will remove any tinge of bitterness and then you can use this plant like cooked spinach so example spanakopita the Greek spinach pie with a filo dough and the feta cheese this the uh, blanched dock greens work really well in that recipe and so do the steamed nettle greens in fact I've got a recipe for wild green spanakopita in my book we can use either of these species. And then in September, the curl dock often produces a set of young leaves again. So you've got a second shot at it. Oh, so to use this as the antidote for the stinging stinging nettle is just grab some dock leaves, just scrunch them up, get the juice out, and then apply that juice to where you were stung and it makes the sting go away. Okay, so this plant uh, is at the opposite end of the spectrum from the native species like the wild leeks and the ostrich ferns. This is one of the most hated species on earth because it is so 
invasive and ecologically disruptive. Uh, there's quite a lot of it in the Berkshires and the good news is it's really yummy and, um, and you can harvest all you want without feeling bad about it. So this is Japanese knotweed. And so people usually know it uh, because it's such an ecological scourge, but, um, but let's get to the yummy part. So, um, so what you're, this is an herbaceous perennial. So it's gonna, all the green part's gonna die at the end of the growing season, but it doesn't disappear. It will persist in the form of these reddish brown bamboo like stalks. This plant isn't even distantly related to bamboo. It's in a completely different branch of the plant world. It's actually related to rhubarb and it tastes like rhubarb. So in the spring, so this would be um, probably about a month from now in the Berkshires, you're gonna see these young shoots come up in the midst of all that dried reddish brown bamboo like stalk. And that's what I call your wild asparagus stage. So you just snap it off or cut it at ground level. And you've got a stalk about a foot long and just steam it for a few minutes and eat it hot or cold like asparagus. But I like to harvest these shoots when they get a little bit taller, what I call the wild rhubarb stage. So I'll let them get about 18 inches, two feet tall. And I'll find the fattest sprouts I can, like three quarters of an inch in diameter, maybe even an inch in diameter. And I cut them off at ground level. And then I peel the skin off of them because the skin is stringy and it can get caught in your teeth. So there's nothing poisonous about it. It's just uh, so that when you use this in cooking, uh, then uh, there's no stringy bits in whatever you use it for. So now the, uh, now the knotweed stalks, as you can see from these cut up pieces, the knotweed stalks are hollow. So when you're peeling it, you don't want to peel too deeply or all you've left is the hole. You just want to get that very outer layer off. And then you end up with this crisp green tube, which is tart and juicy. You can eat it right on the spot. It tastes kind of like a Granny Smith apple, or you can chop it up like I have in this bowl here and then use it instead of rhubarb in virtually any recipe calling for rhubarb. So for example, here is my strawberry knotweed pie. The recipe is in my book. It's really, really yummy. Virtually everybody I serve this pie to say, you know, I like this even better than strawberry rhubarb pie. All right, but you might be looking at this pie and saying, well, I don't know, I'm a little intimidated by pie crust and that lattice work top, I don't know if I can pull that off. So I'm gonna show you an easy way to use the knotweed that requires no cooking skill whatsoever, is you could just take those chopped up pieces like I showed you a couple slides ago and just fill up that hollow bit with like a flavored cream cheese or a salmon mousse or something like that. And then you have this delicious tart edible container that's really fun and you don't need to know how to cook to do that. All right, so here is that other invasive species I mentioned in association with wild leek. So this one is all over the Berkshires too. And this is one of the species I get concerned about when people dig up wild leeks because if they leave any bare soil behind, they're creating the ideal growing medium for the garlic mustard to sneak in, disrupt those ecologically sensitive areas where the wild leeks like to grow. So I don't get quite as excited about eating this one as I do the wild leeks because it's kind of a pungent plant. It's got quite a lot of bitterness to it. So mostly any part of this plant you're going to eat, you're going to need to uh, boil first. Now, some people like to make pesto from it, and that's fine. And if I were to do that, I would probably make it from what I consider to be the mildest part of the plant and that is the second year's growth of this plant, it's setting up a young stem. So when that stem is soft and supple, uh, the flavor is quite mild. You can even eat it raw or you could chop it up using a stir fry or you could make pesto out of it. All right, so here's another member of the mustard family like garlic mustard. So this is called wintercress and this is really common farm weed. And my favorite stage to harvest it is when before the flowers come out, when you see these broccoli florets that look a lot like broccoli rob, you prepare it like broccoli rob, it tastes like broccoli rob. But it's a, it's a, it's a, so garlic mustard's an invasive plant. This one is just a uh, non native, but non invasive plant. You're pretty much only going to see it in on the edge of farms and, and, you know, fields. You're not going to see it pushing into the woods like the garlic mustard can do. Okay, were this to be a live program, I'd ask everybody in the audience, what is this plant? And a few people know what it is now, but I used to get, even from garden clubs, everybody would yell out, phlox, and they'd all be wrong. How do you know it's not phlox? If you look carefully at these flowers, you see that these flowers have four petals. All phlox family flowers have five petals. So this is, in fact, another member of the mustard family called Dame's Rocket, and this is all over the Berkshires. It is an invasive species. This is a total guilt-free foraging opportunity, as is the Japanese knotweed, as is the garlic mustard. Here's another one. And the good news about this one is it is yummy raw. You don't have to cook it at all. No boiling involved. And, and although the whole plant's edible, my favorite part to eat are the flowers. And you see how it comes in a white color and a purpley color? That is 
almost always how you see it in the wild, the two colors together, which makes it really easy to, to identify and recognize and spot it from quite a distance away. You could be many yards away from this plant and see it. And so the flowers have this wonderful, sweet, garlicky, radishy flavor. And, um, and although the white flowers and the purple flowers have the same flavor, I tend to just use the purple flowers because purple is a funner color than white. And these are great thrown in a salad or just decorate whatever other food you're serving. And once again, uh, invasive species. So uh, um, help yourself take all you want of this one, the Dame's Rocket. Okay, now you've got some decent sized mountains in the Berkshires, but uh, this photo I did not take in the Berkshires. That's actually the presidential range in Mount Washington in the background. And I took this photo over Memorial Day weekend, which is when the dandelions are blooming. And that is the purpose of this photo, to talk to you about dandelions, of which you have huge numbers in the Berkshires of dandelions in late April, early May is when I look for them. But I have to tell you that dandelions are probably responsible for turning more people off of eating wild plants than anything else. And the story is usually something like this. It's the spring and you look out in your backyard, you see all these blooming dandelion flowers. You say to yourself, I heard dandelions are edible. I should try them. So you go out to your yard, you pick a couple leaves, you bring them indoors, you put a little oil and vinegar on them, you take a bite. It's incredibly bitter. You spit it out and you say, yuck, I'm never going to eat a wild plant again, which is a real shame because dandelions are great if you eat the right part at the right time. So what is that and when is that? Well, when I start seeing whole fields turning yellow with dandelion flowers, in my opinion, it's really too late to be eating dandelion plants, except the flowers, of course, but the rest of the plant I think is going to be too bitter by then. So this is what I do. So I'm harvesting the plant before the flowers open and my favorite part to eat are these flower buds. <clears throat> and even though each individual flower bud is small, if you look for these plants on the edge of organic farm, a place where you want to talk to the manager, make sure that they're okay with you gathering dandelions there. Uh, but I've never been turned down to gather dandelions at an organic farm. And they're often very large dandelion plants. They're growing in the margins of the fields where I have found over 200 buds per plant. And yes, it takes a little while to pick them off. But if you're finding plants with so many buds on them, you can get all you need to feed yourself, your, your uh, family, uh, whoever you're feeding. Okay, so what do I do with these buds? So I pick them off the plant, throw them in a bucket of water just to wash them off, get a pot of water boiling in the stove, and then cook them for 60 seconds. That's it. And then they're done. And then they're great in soups and omelets or casseroles. But before you do anything with them, before you put any salt or butter on them, just try them plain. I think you'd be amazed at how good they are. I, dandelion buds are among my favorite vegetables, period. They're like a cross between corn, spinach, Brussels sprouts, and artichokes, if you can imagine all that together. And... Um, and yes, so um, so dandelion buds. Now, this photo is out of chronological sequence just because uh, I want to talk to this one next because it's very close cousin of dandelions and it's edible the exact same way. So uh, the leaves of this plant are edible, the flowers are edible, the roots are edible, just like dandelion. So this is chicory. So this is what you'd see blooming in July along the roadsides and stuff like that. So the chicory flowers are edible. Uh, they don't have much flavor, but blue is an unusual food color. So it's fun to just snip the petals off to get them into a salad just to get that blue color in there. And then chicory leaves are edible in the spring or in the fall. In the summer, they're too bitter. But probably the most well-known part of a chicory plant to eat, actually to drink, are the roots. And you make a coffee-like uh, coffee drink from them. So I'll describe how to do that. So basically, you want to gather the roots. And if you were able to recognize chicory plants now, they'll look like dandelion plants, except they'll have a two foot tall dried brown stalk growing out of them. And that and dandelions never have that. Those are chicory plants. So uh, I will gather plants like that in the early spring or in the late fall. That's the best time. You could do it year round, but that's the best time where you're going to get the best yield when you're making this beverage. So then just chop the roots up into uniform pieces and just roast them slowly in an oven until they're brittle and aromatic and then grind them up in a food processor. And then I find I only need about half the amount of grounds to make a beverage that I need to make uh, coffee. And whatever device you use to make the coffee, like... Uh, uh, plunger or Mr. Coffee Maker, you can use the same device with chicory. And when you make the drink and, and you taste it, it is amazing how much it tastes like coffee, especially if you usually drink your coffee with cream and sugar and you drink the chicory drink the same way. Uh, it's really good. The one big difference is chicory does not have caffeine in it. So if you're one of these people who says, what's the point of drinking it? If there's no caffeine in it, then chicory is just not going to cut it for you. 
Okay, here are violets, and there are many different species of violets in the Berkshires, and some are rare. You wouldn't want to pick those, and some have a laxative effect, so you might not want to pick those. But here's the kind that I can steer you toward. It's the most common kind that you're going to see in your lawn or, you know, on the edge of a school ball field, something like that. And these flowers are blooming about the same time that the dandelions have been out for a while. Uh, violet flowers are edible, violet leaves are edible. Uh, they're not quite as good after the flowers go by. So I'd gather them in the spring and you can eat the leaves uh, raw or cooked. And violet flowers are pretty and they're fun to decorate other foods you're serving. You can candy them and use them for decorating other dishes. Chickweed. So chickweed is, uh, uh, I use it so, so ordinarily, where there's not a foot plus of snow in the ground in the Berkshires, you might actually be able to see this plant because it's one of our earliest weeds that you'd see in any kind of cultivated area like a, a farm or a garden. And I use it as a lettuce substitute and a salad or a sprout substitute in a sandwich. And in the fall, it also is nice too. Spring or fall, wild edible. Okay, daisies are edible, but the tastiest part of a daisy are not these flowers. It's actually the leaves before the flowers come out. So you need to recognize the plant at that stage. So this is what it looks like. And I apologize, this photo is a little out of focus, but if you look at these flower buds right here, you see they have a flat top to them. And you'll see that there's little marks on the top of them that looks kind of like the spokes of a bicycle wheel. So I look for that. And then I look for leaves that look like this. And daisy leaves can be so good that uh, I've never bothered to cook them. I'll just put them into a salad and they're really excellent that way. So here is sheep sorrel. So you'll see this place in the Berkshires where you have the more acidic soil. So you would never see like sheep sorrel and wild leek growing where, near each other because they don't like the same soil type. And the sheep sorrel is just a, a diminutive version of the French garden sorrel. So you can use it the same way. You can make a sorrel sauce from it, a sorrel soup from it. Now here is a, okay, let's wake this plant up, wake this slide up. Okay, so here is a plant with the same flavor, completely unrelated, called wood sorrel or sour grass. And, um, and, and uh, any tender part of this plant's edible. So the leaves are edible, the flowers are edible. These little guys right here, these are the immature seed pods. They're tart and juicy, they're edible too. So, um, now, the chemical responsible for the sour flavor in the wood sorrel and the sheep sorrel is a chemical called oxalic acid that might not be good to eat in huge amounts. Like if you ate a tremendous huge salad bowl full of just this plant or the two plants together, it might uh, uh, impair your body's ability to absorb calcium and it might irritate your stomach lining. But there's no reason to be unduly concerned about that chemical because it's present in a lot of conventional vegetables like beets and spinach and rhubarb. So as long as you're eating in a moderation, it should be fine. Okay, another really common garden weed called lamb's quarters. This is a photo from early June. So that's when I'd expect to see it at this stage. Uh, but anytime the plant is at this stage, uh, you can harvest it and eat it. And this one um, is in fact a wild cousin of spinach. The dust that you see at each plant, that's not from the gravel road or anything. That's a natural mealy dust the plant produces on its own. It's one of the ways to help recognize this plant. And this plant's very mild, so you can eat it raw, you can eat it cooked, you do not have to boil it, you can just steam it. This is also an excellent ingredient, a substitute for spinach and spanakopita, is you just throw the uh, lamb's quarters, uh, tender parts of the plant in the skillet with all your other ingredients, you don't have to pre-boil it first. Okay, so when I make stuff from wild ingredients, I'm not a purist about it. I don't insist that every single ingredient be wild. So for example, when I make that strawberry knotweed pie, I don't know if you use yak butter for this shortening. I could use regular sugar, regular butter, and the uh, knotweed makes it a wild dish. But it is fun to make a salad completely from wild ingredients, which is what this one was. Although I don't want to deter you from just throwing a few dame's rocket flowers or violet flowers uh, into a salad just to, you know, give it a wild, uh, you know, accent. Um, you don't have to go extreme like I did here. All right. So in here, let me talk about uh, what's in here. So we've got some chicory flowers in here, bulking up this, uh, 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 coloring the salad, some wild mustard flowers in here. And uh, then there's lamb's quarters and chickweed and sheep saw and wood saw and stuff like that. That's the green stuff bulking up the salad. And then these little red berries are partridge berries and they're around year round. So they would be around now, even under the snow. And so um, 
this is what you want to look for. Now, partridge berries have virtually no flavor. So why use them? Because they're pretty. So I'll just pick a few and then put them on top of a salad just to get that nice red color in there. Okay, so I am going to talk about mushrooms more later in the show than now uh, because, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, scratch that. I'm just talking about springtime wild edibles in this show. So you're not going to get to see uh, lots and lots of mushrooms that come out in the summer and the fall because that's the main mushroom hunting in New England is uh, from, let's say, mid-July to mid-October. And this uh, show is going to end at the end of June. So uh, anyway, but I want to talk about several mushroom species you might find in the spring. And this is the first one. This is called the black morel. And I have found this one in the woods in the Berkshires, but the other place I've often, often seen it is not in the woods, but actually right in people's yards, like in the pea gravel by the foundation of the house or by the shrubbery or by the uh, uh, mulch around the plantings around the house. So all these mushrooms came from one person's yard. This happened to be an Eastern Mass, but uh, you could find these many black morels in Western Mass too. And uh, I like to play a joke on the kids when I'm doing a live program. I ask them what this thing is down at the bottom here. Do you know what that is? And of course, us older people know it's a film canister. Yes, we used to have to take photos with film and the film would be contained. So obviously that film canister is in there for scale. So you get to see what size the morel mushrooms are. Okay, so that's the black morel. The kind that you're more likely to see though in the Berkshires is this one. This is the yellow morel. So this photo on the right is from the Berkshires. This photo on the left is from Pepperell Mass. This is up um, in Northern Middlesex County, right near the Hampshire border. So where uh, are you gonna find the yellow morels? Well, there's three spots I would look for in the Berkshires. One spot is under uh, old apple trees. The second spot is under recently dead elm trees where the bark, this is American elm trees, where the bark is still attached to the tree and it hasn't sloughed off yet. So if the bark is sloughed off, usually I find that the, the, um, the um, uh, tree isn't producing any morels yet. And then the third place I find morels is in the same rich woods habitat where place, plants like the wild leek grows. So if you're in the woods and, and you see wild leeks and maidenhair fern and the blue cohosh and other indicator species there, you may also find the yellow morels too. And uh, I wish you luck. I hope you're able to find them because uh, um, Morels are maddeningly elusive to find in Eastern Mass. So consider yourselves lucky that they're more common out in Western Mass. Okay, then there's oyster mushrooms and oyster mushrooms can come out in the spring or in the fall. And um, now this would be a good time to just issue one cautionary note about mushroom hunting that's different from plants. And I could have said this in the beginning, but let me just say now. Some of you novices that have never foraged before, you might be saying to yourself, just how risky is it to put some wild gathered thing in my mouth? Could I get sick? Could I even die? And the answer is different for plants and mushrooms. For plants, the chances of you getting very sick and dying uh, from eating a plant is relatively low if you follow this one simple uh, advice I give you is don't eat plants that taste bad. Now, there are a couple notable exceptions to this. Uh, there's poison hemlock and water hemlock, which are plants that look like and are related to wild carrot that are potentially lethal plants. And apparently they don't taste bad enough to deter people from eating them. And so that is cases in Massachusetts where people have actually died eating those plants. So, uh, so I'm very cautious with plants in that family, which is called the APAC. It used to be called the umbelliferae, plants that look like parsley or carrot. Uh, but the vast majority of poisonous plants that grow in New England taste horrible. So my advice is don't eat plants that taste bad. doesn't mean that every edible plant is going to be delicious straight from the bush or vine or whatever. A lot of them require some kind of advanced preparation. But if you see a plant that you think is edible and you bring it home, you prepare it according to instructions, you got a big steaming plate of it in front of you and you take a bite and it doesn't taste good, you might not want to override that danger signal your taste buds might be giving you. You might have made a mistake in identification. All right, but that rule does not apply to mushrooms. We have uh, dozens of mushrooms that have toxins in them. Um, uh, now, most of those mushrooms would just give you several hours of very uncomfortable gastrointestinal distress. Now, I wouldn't wish that on anybody either, but we have 
uh, at least six that are potentially lethal. And unfortunately, there's nothing whatsoever from the flavor of those lethal mushrooms that give you any advance notice that there's anything to worry about. So you could have this delicious mushroom meal one day and be dead several days later from liver and or kidney failure. All right, so the risk of picking the wrong kind of mushroom and getting very sick and possibly even dying is much, much greater than for plants. So that's why uh, I, you, you have to give them a much more heightened level of respect, make sure you've got the right thing. So in the case of the morels, um, they're, they're, uh, the main lookalike to the true morels is something called a false morel. And if you cut every true morel, in half, you'll see it's completely hollow inside where the false morel has uh, only undulations in the outside. Doesn't look like a sponge on a stick like these do. It just has an undulating outer part. And if you cut a false morel down the center, you'll see that it has tissues cutting this way and that way and this way and that way through it. So don't eat false morels. Um, uh, now the oyster mushroom is a little bit trickier because there are some poisonous lookalikes to the mushroom. Not uh, not any really deadly poisonous lookalikes, but this is one I wouldn't put um, as easily identifiable as morel. But anyway, look for oyster mushrooms mainly. Sometimes you find them on the same elm trees that might produce a morel, even if they're deader, because uh, these mushrooms live on dead wood or maple trees, the other place I often see the oyster mushrooms. And I see them in May and in November. So I hope you find some of those. And then here's the last one I wanna talk about. This is an interesting mushroom because um, it pretty much confines itself to wood chips. That's where you see where it grows. And wood chips aren't created naturally, they're created by a chipper. And so where you're gonna see these is where wood chips are being put down, like in landscaping. And so this is called the wine cap strafaria and permaculturalists love this mushroom because it's one that they can grow along with all their berry trees, berry bushes, nut trees and stuff like that. And it's called the wine cap strafaria because the cap often has this deep red wine type color and Strafaria russigoso onulata means it has this really wild looking ring to it. That's, it almost looks like teeth sticking out right here. And then the gills, you see the gills here, they're the smoky gray color. Uh, and the spores that they drop would be that smoky gray color. So, so all these characteristics help you distinguish this species from the poisonous lookalikes. But one again, once again, though, the gilled mushrooms are responsible for 90% of all mushroom fatalities. So if you uh, are a novice mushroom hunter, uh, you might want to uh, wait on this one to have built up some experience and confidence before you start uh, going into the gilled mushrooms. <clears throat> all right, so that's all I'm, I'm going to be able to say about uh, mushrooms today because we're just doing a springtime talk. So let's get into another plant that's available in the springtime. So this is a plant that you might know from when you get home from a walk and you find these burrs caught in your socks from your dog's fur. And the guy who invented Velcro did get the idea from the from these burrs, by the way. So this is a plant appropriate enough called burdock. And it's got two edible parts I want to talk about today. So one is the root. Burdock is a biennial plant. It has a two-year life cycle. And the second year, it looks like this as it's beginning to leaf out. And so you could um, eat the big, long taproot that's uh, underneath the ground, or you could harvest at the end of the first year too. The problem is that you can't just yank on this foliage and, and get the root out that way. It will break on you. So you have to dig the roots up, which is a lot of work and I don't generally bother. And I pretty much guarantee that your patience will give out before the root does because they're very, very long. And so what I will do is, uh, uh, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So I don't usually bother to dig up a root. So, but if you're gonna do it, uh, you might get a uh, you know, root that's about that long. So let me see if my hands are in the shot here. Yes, so maybe a foot, foot and a half long. The root kept going. And so what do you do with it at that stage? Well, really easy way to prepare is just wash it off. You don't have to peel it, slice it into half inch thick rounds and boil it in salt and water till it's tender. About 15 minutes, it will taste like a starchy artichoke. But I'm too lazy to do that. Instead, I harvest the plant during its second year of growth when it's beginning to send out its flower stalk. Whoops flower stalk. And um, so I'm harvesting it when it's about a foot, foot and a half tall, cutting at ground level, lopping off the top cluster leaves. And you see all these stems I gathered in less than a half an hour. Now you do have to peel the outer layer of a burdock stem because it's bitter and stringy. So you want to take that bit off. 
But unlike the knotweed, the burdock stems are solid all the way through. So even after you take that outer part off, the inner part is solid all the way through. So you chop that up into half inch pieces and then boil that to salted water till it's tender, which is about seven minutes. And then it's this delicious wild vegetable, which you can um, uh, eat just plain or mix it in spaghetti sauce. A really great way to use it is in a recipe that I'm sure a lot of you have uh, eaten, perhaps some of you have even made it yourself, or ordinarily you take artichoke hearts and mayonnaise and breadcrumbs and you uh, and Parmesan cheese and you mix it all together, you bake it in the oven, you spread, you put on crackers. Well, you can substitute the boiled burdock flour stuck rounds in that recipe instead of the artichokes and it comes out great. And that recipe is on my webpage. So there it is, the burdock flour stuck bake, uh, really easy to make. Okay, so here's a plant that, um, uh, we see a lot in Eastern Mass, maybe even more than Western Mass, and it's a thorny mess, uh, pain to bushwhack through. But the, but in the spring, it produces a tender part right here. Um, and this is called catbriar, bullbriar, greenbriar. But there's a cousin of this plant I think is even tastier, and it's this one right here. So this is a plant called carrion flower, and you harvest it like asparagus. You prepare it like asparagus. It tastes like asparagus. It's related to asparagus. So why is it called carrion flower? So here we are camping. We're using a Frisbee as a plate here. We've steamed some carrion flower shoots. And you see these little spherical things here. Those are the flower buds. If we waited just a week longer, when the flower buds bloom, you hold your nose up to that and it smells just like rotting meat or dirty gym socks. So that's why it's called carrion flower. So this plant, when you when it's blooming, it's kind of an unpleasant encounter to run into it. But if you harvest it before it blooms, it's quite tasty. Okay, so this is another species that is on the invasive species list in Massachusetts called black locust. It's all over the Berkshires. It has one edible part and the edible part is around, it's available around the end of May for a couple of weeks and it is the flowers and the flowers smell like jasmine and they taste like sweet pea pods. So they're really good. Okay, so there's a bumblebee in the center of the photo and you might be saying, oh gee, the bumblebees visit these flowers. I better not pick any flowers because I don't wanna take food away from the pollinators. Don't worry. First of all, this is invasive species. Second of all, these trees grow 40 or 50 feet tall. And when they're blooming, they're blooming from top to bottom. Let the bumblebees visit the flowers in the upper branches. And you pick, can pick some of the flowers from the lower branches. There's plenty of flowers to go around if you all have them. So these, you pick them off their central stems, and then you can eat them just plain, add them to salads. But a really fun way to use them is to make fritters from them. And I have this recipe in my book, Black Locust Fritters. It's really good. Okay, pokeweed's edible, and it's only the young shoots when they come out in the spring, and then you want to boil them for seven minutes to make them safe to eat. And this is what you want to look for. That's a pokeweed shoot, so that you just cut that at ground level. Make sure you don't get any of the root, because the root is always very poisonous, cut above the ground, and then you have to boil these shoots for seven minutes. And then they won't shrink or get all mushy on you, even after all that boiling. So, um, so anyway... Uh, once you've done that, um, then you can eat it. And uh, um, let me just tell you one secret about finding pokeweed, because when you see a plant like that, you say, well, gee, there's got to be other plants that look like that. How do I know that's a pokeweed plant? Well, here is the big favor the plant does for you. So there is last year's stalks. So like the knotweed, at the end of the growing season, they don't rot away, they persist, and they'll still be there the following spring when the shoots are coming up in the exact same spot where last year's sprouts came up. And when you see that, then you know that they're pokeweed shoots. Okay, now milkweed's edible, and I call it a procrastinating forager's dream food because there's at least four edible stages to the plant, and they happen chronologically in succession. So if you mess up and miss a stage, you just wait a while till the next edible stage develops. So this is actually edible stage number three, um, and uh, it's the flower buds, and they're in a nice, nice tight green cluster. And uh, these flower buds, um, oh, in case I didn't say, so the cooking method for pokeweed shoots and the cooking method for milkweed is the exact same. You boil the plants for seven minutes and then pour off the water, and that's adequate cooking for both of them. And uh, these milkweed flower buds in this in this uh, purple bowl on the right side here, they've already been boiled for seven minutes. Look how well they held up. If anything, they look even nicer than they did when they were on the plant. And you could just eat these just plain like this as a side dish. A really good way to use them is a recipe from my book called Milkweed Egg Puff, which is like a cross between a souffle and a casserole. And even the milkweed 
Uh, pods are edible up to an inch long. You can boil them for seven minutes and the texture and the flavor is really similar to green beans. Okay, but here is the monarch caterpillar to remind us the importance, the ecological importance that this plant has. And so it is really important for there to be lots of milkweed plants around for the butterflies to find them, lay their eggs on and for the caterpillars to be able to eat the leaves and stuff. And so uh, I uh, propagate milkweed plants in my nursery. I uh, distribute a lot of them out to other people. One great way for you to uh, just help encourage milkweeds to grow is in the fall, you know, when you see the pods, how they've riped, ripened and split open, you see the parachute business attached to the seed beginning to show. You could just gather a couple of those pods, throw them in your car. And then as you're driving around, you see some good milkweed plant habitat that doesn't have any, like the edge of a school ball field or a bike path, something like that. Just release the parachutes and help start a new colony there. This is what I did as my payback to this plant to help uh, balance out the foraging that I do is I plant it in my own yard. So there is my house, there's my car, uh, uh, <laughs> that's my old car, that's my boat. So here we put blueberries next to our driveway and we allowed the common milkweed, that's the one that's edible, to grow uh, with the, the blueberry plants. And so, um, so the monarch butterflies found them, they lay their eggs in the plant, the caterpillars ate the leaves on our plants. We know that because we found this chrysalis attached to our garage door. And so fortunately attached on a hinge. So when the door goes up and down, it wouldn't squish the chrysalis, it just went for a ride. And two weeks later, that chrysalis is empty because the butterfly metamorphosed and flown away. So yeah, so it's great with native plants uh, to add some to your yard to supplement uh, the foraging opportunities in the wild. Okay, um, Heather, I wanna just check in with you. It's already uh, almost eight o'clock and I probably have another 20 minutes to go. Are we good or should I wrap up? Well, I can't hear you. Yep, sorry, I'm muted, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, if you could um, wrap up in the next 10 minutes, that would probably be good if that's okay. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right, so, so I'm gonna apologize in advance. I'm probably gonna have to skip a couple of the plants between now and the end of the show. Mm -hmm. uh, but since I already teased you with this one, I have to talk to you about this one. So this is sassafras, a uh, very easy to recognize wild edible because it has leaves with three different shapes, no thumbs, one thumb, and two thumbs all in the same plant. It's the only plant that does that. So there's two parts that are edible on sassafras. There's the root bark, which has that very uh, uh, familiar root beer smell. Now the Food and Drug Administration thinks that saffron, which is a, uh, an essential oil inside the root bark might be carcinogenic to people. And so uh, they have banned saffron containing uh, uh, um, sassafras products in the food supply. Uh, and, um, uh, but the studies were based on rats. I don't know of any studies where uh, people have gotten cancer from eating sassafras. But even so, if all you need to hear is that uh, the Food and Drug Administration thinks that the roots might be carcinogenic and you just say, okay, I'm not eating them. I totally support you in that. In fact, I totally support you wherever you draw the line about anything I've talked about today. If you're not sure you've recognized the right plant, you're not sure you've collected from an uncontaminated area and you want to, st you want to stay away from contaminations in the soil or in the plants, uh, and you decide not to pick something, I think that's very sensible. So let me teach you another part of the sassafras where the saffron isn't an issue, and that's young sassafras leaves. That's what filet powder is made from, dried powdered sassafras leaves. So you can make your own. Now, obviously you wouldn't want to denude whole trees, taking off all the leaves, take a few leaves from this tree, a few leaves from that tree, and then just dry them out and then pulverize the dried leaves and then make a powder out of them and then add that to your food near the end of flavor and thicken it. Okay, I'm gonna skip cattails, sorry. And I'm gonna skip the, um, all right, let's talk about this one. So this is basswood or uh, little leaf linden. The leaves are edible in the spring and you make a tea from the flowers. And these flowers will be out around the first day of summer. And the tea has a wonderful lemon honey flavor and it's soothing to your digestive system and your mental state. So uh, herbalists love to recommend it to people. Okay, so here's shad bush, and this is a, uh, a scene as you're going from the valley into the higher elevations in the Berkshires in April. This is a plant that you'll see blooming along the roadsides, and that's a great time to spot it if you want to harvest the fruit, because that's what the fruit looks like in June. And this fruit looks a lot like blueberries, but it doesn't taste like blueberries at all. It's like a cross between 
uh, cherries and almonds because it's related to cherries and almonds. Uh, and it's fun to stuff your face right by the tree where you can dry the fruit. I've got a couple of this in recipes in my book for the June berries. Uh, they're very yummy. And yes, um, uh, June berries is a native species, but it is one of our most frequently deployed species in parks by landscapers. And so uh, this shot was taken in Charlestown, Mass. So right in the middle of, you know, very, very urban Boston, the state DCR planted some shadbush uh, or Juneberry bushes. And I would go on my lunch hour since it was across the river from where I used to work and pick quarts of fruit on my lunch hour. So, and you can also propagate Juneberries from seed. I don't have talk, time to talk about that. Mulberries are ripe the same time as Juneberries. And you'll often see areas along the pavement where, that's been stained dark purple. And then you just look up and you see where the mulberry fruits are. So I will mix Juneberry mulberry fruits together. It makes judel from them. Wild strawberries go wild in the Berkshires. So I don't need to tell you how to eat a wild strawberry. Uh, I'm gonna skip the dailies. I'm gonna skip the Indian cucumber. Okay, wintergreen. Uh, these fruits are available year round. You can make a drink from these wintergreen leaves, but I prefer to make it from black or yellow birch. And you could do this any time of year. You just gather the twigs and peel them. So you could do this tomorrow if you wanted to, even with a foot of snow in the ground, go out and find black or yellow birch trees, gather some twigs, peel them, and put the peelings and the peeled twigs in a um, jar of water and let it sit around for an hour. And you'll get a beverage that tastes just like eating a wintergreen flavored lifesaver. And yes, later on this spring, you can tap birch trees for sap as long as they're big enough, just like the maple trees. And, uh, and you could boil it down and make uh, something that's a lot similar to uh, molasses. And yes, you can sow birch trees from seed. We'll skip this. Oh, I wasn't going to talk to you about mushrooms. I left the sulfur shelf in the show. Sorry, going on to grapes. And I'm not going to talk to you about the grapes. I'm going to talk to you about grape leaves, which you gather in June. And this is the species that I see predominant in the Berkshires. This is called the riverside grape, where the leaves are smooth and green on the underside. And the good news for you is the people I know that make stuffed grape leaves say this is the best species to use. And this is the one you have in the Berkshires. So in May and June is when you want to look for these leaves when they're fully grown, but nice and young. And I will blanch them for 20 seconds just to soften them up so they don't tear when you stuff them. And then I stuff them and prepare them and they're really good. And it's really fun thing to serve to company when you can say, hey, yeah, these are these stuffed grape leaves are from wild grape leaves that we picked and stuffed ourselves. Okay, so ground nut, this is available year round. So in May or June, you'll see plants like this. So the flowers won't be out yet, but the tubers are there year round. And you can, um, so far, my favorite way to use them is just to slice them crosswise and fry them in a little vegetable oil and make ground nut chips. It's a native species, very important food for uh, uh, indigenous people as was this one. So Jerusalem artichoke grows wild in the Berkshires, but its original homeland was the upper Midwest. So how did it get to New England? Our indigenous people traded for it is that we had things that appealed to the Midwestern tribes and we got Jerusalem artichoke tubers in return. And it is very likely where there are wild patches of Jerusalem artichokes in the Berkshires, they're there because they are or descended from patches that were originally established by Native Americans. So here's the edible part, the tubers. And I've seen them with this kind of purpley color in the outside or this beige color on the outside. There's the golf ball for scale and they're edible either way. And you could use them most ways to use potatoes. You can bake them, boil them, mash them, fry them and so on. And finally, that's the end of my show. Thank you very much. And sorry, I didn't have time to talk to you about all the yummy stuff that's on later in the season, but then we would have been on for at least another hour. So <laughs> with that, I'm happy to take questions. And before we get into questions, while you're thinking about questions, mm -hmm. if you're free to put them in the chat or you can go off mute and ask me. Um, let me just talk about my book that I kept mentioning. So this book has a lot of the stuff we talked about today. So there's this strawberry not wheat pie. Uh, there's the black locust we talk about. Cattails I didn't get a chance to talk about, but there's a chapter in my book about cattails. And then, you know, the summer and fall things to harvest, like the autumn olives that grow in the Berkshires, the elderberries that grow in the Berkshires. So uh, the book was actually written for Essex County, which is in Northeast Mass, but almost everything in this book also grows in the Berkshires. And the book's available online. So if this were a in-person program, I would, you know, have books on hand. I could sell you one. I could sign one for you. So anyway, you'll have to go online to get one if you want. And you just go to Greenbelt. Uh, um, 
and you could buy it from their store. And there, there's other places that sell them online too, like the Mass Association of, Cons Association of Conservation Commissions. I gave them some books and they'll sell them. So um, uh, I don't keep any of the money these books make though. I give it all to uh, the nonprofits that sell them and to the publisher especially to Greenbelt in gratitude for the fact that they allow foraging as a permitted activity in all their properties that are open to the public. I'm so grateful for that, yeah. that I just said, keep all the money the book makes and just buy more land with it. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Well, thanks, Russ. This has been so fascinating. I will say we, we have a lot of garlic mustard at the Bidwell House Museum that we're always kind of fighting with. So I know Aaron, our caretaker who couldn't be here, has made a lot of pesto with it, but that's, it only touches a tiny bit of the uh, garlic mustard that we have. But um, but this was fascinating. And I did share uh, your website in the chat so people can go there. Uh, but I see Vivian has a question. So if you want to ask it, um, go right ahead, Vivian. Hi, Roz. So great talk as usual. And um, I, I was interested that you mentioned a few things that were suitable for propagation. I remember specifically um, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the wild leeks. And um, what else did you mention for propagation? Or can you think now? OK, well, so, so as, as, as yeah. Heather kindly mentioned in the um, intro, uh, as after I retired from uh, working for the Mass Fish and Game Department on rivers, which brought me out to the Berkshires all the time, I'm now propagating and planting edible native species. And so one of my sites in the Southern Berkshires is Riverwalk, the waterfall Riverwalk uh, that um, has been transformed, as many of you know, from this uh, just neglected eyesore, the bank of the Housatonic River in Great Barrington to this uh, fabulous natural area, thanks to the efforts started by Rachel Fletcher of thousands of citizens that pitched in and helped transform that area to just this fabulous place to go. So uh, if you've never been down there before, just go to, I think it's the Rite Aid Drugstore, uh, right on Route 7, just a couple blocks north of the middle of very busy Great Barrington. And um, and just follow the trail down into the woods there. And it takes you along the river and you're one block away from busy Route 7. And you could be, you know, way off, uh, you know, in nature somewhere with the sounds of the river and all the gorgeous native plants. So um, so anyway, there are um, uh, there are over 180 species of plants that are native to Northeast regions that are edible by people. And I figured out how to grow over 100 of them. And so uh, that's, um, you know, and these are all seed grown plants. And so, for example, wild strawberries, really easy to grow from seed. So the slide that I, um, let me go back as long as we're here. Let me just uh, activate my slideshows here. Since you asked, Vivian, let me go back to the wild strawberry. Okay, here we go. So you may know this scene. This is Miss Hall School in Pittsfield. So they have a greenhouse on their campus in Pittsfield. And so I brought them some wild strawberry seed. And you can see what they did is they just took these plastic clamshells that were buying our berries in anyway, and they put the growing medium in there. And then they sprinkled the wild strawberry seed in there. And they were able to grow the plants out to get big enough to sell them to the same homeowners that were coming by their spring plant sale to buy their broccoli starts and the tomato plants and stuff like that. And so anybody that's growing, uh, you know, seedlings to distribute, uh, I think that'd be great to great ideas to branch off into the uh, native species that can easily be grown uh, in the same process. Uh, why not? Why not offer those to people? So there's lots, lots more, Vivian. And as you may know, I do talks just on that subject where I'm talking about, uh, you know, edible native plants and how to propagate them and add them to the landscape. So hey, we'll keep but today's up. talk was more about everything that's edible in the spring. <laughs> Thank you, Russ. Sure. So um, I, I had a question. Um, so you talked about ramps, which I, yes. I definitely noticed on, you know, restaurant menus sort of right. exploded a few years ago. Right. Um, and so I wondered, are there any other local plants that you see that are getting popular that people should be careful in mind? Well, fiddleheads of? would be the, the next one okay. that immediately comes to mind. Yeah. And um, what I hear from other people, so to some extent, I've observed this myself, but I've certainly heard other people, they'll say, 
Oh yeah, um, it's a bad scene about fiddleheads here because of the commercial exploitation of them that the places that regular people used to go and gather a few to bring home and cook up for themselves, mm -hmm. they'll go to their favorite spot and it's been completely wiped out and decimated by the people picking to sell the plants. Right. And that's just irresponsible mm -hmm. to harvest plants like that. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely is not an honorable harvest as Robin Wall Kimmer would say. Uh, uh, and, it, and it's also very short-sighted because if you're harvesting plants that way and you may actually be harming them and then the, the patch is not going to be healthy and if, if they're continuing to harvest so hard, they're going to die on you and then that's mm -hmm. not good for anybody. So right. Right. Um, you're, you're getting rid of your future business by right, harvesting right. all of them. It doesn't make right. sense. Right. So, so one or two cola parts per clump, that's the right mm -hmm. way to do it. So yeah. um, now, as you may know, as some uh, of our uh, folks participating in this, uh, in this online program may know, mm -hmm. there's also a similar analogous problem with medicinal plants. Mm -hmm. And the poster child for that is ginseng. Ginseng mm -hmm. used to be a common plant in the Berkshires. And now uh, it's quite unusual to see it. I have seen it in the Berkshires, but it's, uh, but it's not something that you run into very frequently. And it used to be very common. And why is it much less common? Because people dug it up to sell it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't people, you know, medicating themselves or a local herbalist treating mm -hmm. a few clients with ginseng. No, it was people converting the plants to cash. Yeah. So that's the problem when, when uh, you know, wild plants become an article of commerce and, and, and you're, you're basically monetizing the outdoors. Now, uh, I will say that there is uh, an assiduous effort, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, I'm glad to see is catching on, of people propagating these native plants, uh, mm -hmm. which is great. So there's people attempting to uh, propagate ramps in an ethical way in the mm -hmm. woods. Um, uh, there's a guy named Walker. Uh, let's see, what is his last name? He just gave a program at um, uh, Connecticut NOFA that, that sponsored this about, uh, I think it's called the Northeast Forest Farming Association. And they have developed a protocol for propagating mm -hmm at-risk medicinal species and edible species like uh, ginseng and golden seal and wild leeks in the woods mm -hmm. to help reduce the pressure on the wild populations. Wow, wow. Oh, that's that's great that people are like, understanding the, the problem and, and trying to fix it. Um, right. I did have one other question that came through um, just directly to me. If you had any websites you recommended for good plant identification that people can use when they're out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so, uh, so let me, let me just respond to that question uh, with something else that I think perhaps this person has in mind. And that is, I want to know what's a good foraging app. Yeah, <laughs> sure. If there's and, a uh, the, and there is a foraging app. There's a guy named Wildman Steve Brill, who's my counterpart for the New York City metropolitan area that has developed one. And um, I've never used it, but, you uh -huh. know, he knows the stuff, so it, it could be quite good. But my feeling is that, first of all, um, um, I would be nervous if I tried to base my plant ID solely on a picture of a plant on a phone, mm -hmm. uh, because um, it's it's you know it's a little bit hard. I mean, some things are really really obvious and they're very distinctive looking, but mm -hmm. a lot of plants are you know the their way to distinguish them is more subtle. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure I'd rely on just a picture of a plant on a phone. Sure. Um, now. Um, what you can do, though, if you're willing to invest a little time and effort into the process, mm -hmm. is you can go to a site called iNaturalist that is a citizen science site where everybody takes pictures of everything and posts it online. And then it's like Wikipedia is that people will say, oh, yes, I agree that your suggested ID is this or no, I don't agree. And here's why it's actually mm -hmm. why. And uh -huh. so uh, so you post your pictures up there and then uh, you'll know you took the picture. You'll know where that picture was taken. And so mm -hmm. if you get confirmation from your peers through iNaturalist that in fact, you have found the right thing, then you can feel much more confident that uh, you can go back and, and harvest and eat that one. 
Okay. That's great. I just, I just looked that up while you were talking and shared the link in the chat. So that's, that's good to know that you can kind of get feedback from other people who might know a little bit better than you. Right. And, <laughs> and there are, there, you know, there are certainly, you know, uh, Facebook groups and stuff that are about mm -hmm. foragers. And uh, I kind of don't like them because everybody's kind of, you know, interested in boasting. Look what I found. And they show you this <laughs> huge pile of fiddleheads. They probably pick too many of in order to impress everyone. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm not really into that. Uh, sure. Uh, sure. You know, um, so, um, you know, the best way to learn stuff, especially from mushrooms, is to learn from a person and not mm -hmm. from a website or an app or anything. Yeah. So uh, try to find somebody who's actually leading a walk and learn, you know, in the field from them. So mm -hmm. uh, so I recognize that, you know, this is more of, uh, uh, you know, a bit of a tease to talk about wild edibles, you know, when we can't actually see these plants and we're mm -hmm. doing it all via computer. Right. So I guess in June, we'll have an opportunity to meet the plants directly <laughs> at the Bibwell house and, right. and learn them. And, uh, and I'm not the only person that does this. If you, mm -hmm. if you uh, go online, you'll find other people mm -hmm. uh, like Ariana Alexandrova Collins, I believe her name is. She's um, the part-time staff person for the Hoosick River Watershed Association, but she also knows her wild edibles and leads mm -hmm. walks for people. So right. you may be able to find her. And there's other folks in the Berkshires that do it too. So I mm -hmm. hope you're able to, you know, get out there and wander around with a knowledgeable person and learn that way. Great. Well, and that was the perfect segue to remind everyone who's still on the call that we are doing a walk in June. And as I said at the beginning, we'll put up some information online, um, hopefully in the next month or so with all of the details about that. Uh, but yeah, we'll do a foraging walk on the property, which will be really fun. And so you can have this one-on-one -on -one with Russ where he can point out things directly in person, which I know is actually for me the way that I would learn best. I, I need to work with somebody as opposed to being on, you know, online or looking at pictures. So, um, all right, well, I don't have any other questions that have come through, but I do want to say Thank you so much, Ross. This was just fascinating. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. You know, I uh, um, I guess I must do, uh, I know I talk really, really fast and that's, you know, so, so those of you that were able to watch this show, it was recorded, right, yeah, Heather? Yeah, it was so, recorded. It's recording right now. Okay, so, will, so you can, you can, once, you know, once we get it um, um, up onto YouTube, I'll, I'll share the link with everyone. Right, and then, and then, you know, for anything that I blasted past that you weren't <laughs> able to hear, you'll get another chance to listen again right. and, and right. hopefully learn some more from it. Yeah. And, and Russ has his email up here too. So if you know you have specific inquiries, you can always uh, write to him and right. get his book. And uh, right. yeah, so. in the meantime, enjoy the snow. It's really great. We finally have some decent coverage. So I know, uh, I know. Uh, get out there and, 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 you know, I certainly will. And then, um, and then, you know, spring will happen eventually. And then we can go out and find these plants. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much, Russ. And thank you everyone for making it tonight. And um, yeah, we'll see you all soon. All right. Bye, all right. everyone. Bye.